Hey guys, so we're going to start today with another hybrid tutorial, which is again a tutorial that has both a blog and a video component. So, um, like generally they're designed to supplement each other. Uh, I recommend probably like having both on at once and using the video to help you understand the blog, since the video will basically um, create images of everything I describe in the blog, so it could be easier to visualize. And today's topic is going to be centroid decomposition, which is a technique I find very cool to... Well, it solves various different types of problems, and in this tutorial I'm going to essentially walk you through how to use it to solve a specific problem. And hopefully it should give enough insight to understand the technique and what we do and how it works. So let's start with a beautiful header that I'm going to write out right now. Centroid decomposition. And we'll underline it. Okay, so we have an obligatory check that we're still recording. We're good. Um, okay, so first, let's just... Um, oh yeah, and you can also... I've linked the blog where you can see the... You can see a playlist of basically all the past tutorials I've done. I've done. Right now I've only done one other one, but these will accumulate over time. So... Let's start with this. We're going to use zero indexing because that's just how I do it normally. And yeah. <coughs> so let's start on the example. Um, wrong tab. <coughs> this example is as follows. Um, this is a well known problem in central decomposition tutorials. It's called, um, I guess, Xenia and Tree. And Well, it's a cool problem. I will I can select a color. I will describe what it means right now. So you're given a tree, and I'll just draw one out. And I'm filling these in for a reason, because it's going to be useful that we have them filled in later on. So we're just going to make a big tree. of different size vertices, apparently. And yeah, we're going to put some more on this side. That should be enough. OK, so now we're going to draw edges between them. Um, let's say maroon edges, because why not? So we're going to make all of these. Now we have a very big tree. Okay, now we're going to give all these nodes a label. Let's just um, so we'll have 0, 1. Doesn't really matter how we label these, it's just going to be a tree. So this is a tree with 13 vertices. And the problem and the problem at hand is essentially you're given two types of queries. One type of query is to let's say circle a node in red, or the it's asked to paint a node red, but we're gonna use circles. And then the other query is given some vertex, find the closest red node to it. So for example, or find the distance to the closest red node. So for example, this would be distance would be one, two, three, four, five, six. So the answer to this would be six. If we were to ask about this node, it's zero because that node is red. And we were to ask this about this one, it would be one and two. So uh, we're given that the 
node 0 is initially circled, and we're just going to arbitrarily root it there. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what we do with it. So, yes, that's the problem. Um, how do we even attack this? Let's, um, I'll start with a prerequisite first. It's just a single one this time. Like, you have to know, to understand this, you should know what this is. You should know what a tree is. And then also how to traverse one. Because, um, well, you should... All you have to know for this is DFS. That's the most advanced thing we use for this. So that's the prerequisite, but it's not really that big a deal. So let's move. What the? Let's move on to how we solve this. Okay. So slight blooper there. All right. Now. Let's start by thinking about the problem in a different way. So, we're going to find, let's say we do root the tree at zero. Now we're going to find for each vertex, let's say we're looking at this, no, let's say, this, let's say we're looking at this one. We're going to find for each vertex, the closest red vertex to it in its subtree. So that would be, for this, the red vertex in this one. For this, would be the red vertex in this one. And, of course, for this, would be the whole tree. So we want to find the closest red vertex. And every time we get an update, we want to maintain this information over time. So, for example, right now, none of these have a red vertex in their subtree except for this one. So this has, a, we'll call it, We'll call it an array called best. Um, that's the notation I use. So best of v is the closest red vertex in its subtree. In subtree. Closest red vertex in subtree. Just paint that there. Okay. Um, so one thing we can do is we can essentially treat n the first vertex being, we can treat vertex zero being red as a, simply an update, that our first query is that we change the color of vertex zero to red. So that, that part's fine. That doesn't have to be a special case. Then, more in general, we have to handle both updates and queries. <clears throat> so let's pick some vertex. Let's say we set this one to red. Now, how does it affect the values of best in each of the each of the um, other vertices? Well, for example, it doesn't affect this one because this is not in its subtree. And it won't affect this one because of the same reason or this one, but it will affect the vertex itself and all of its parents, or all of its ancestors. So essentially what we have to do is we have to, essentially what we have to do is we have to, um, anyway. We have to update the information for all of the parents. So again, these four vertices are affected by setting this node to red. So what do we do? We say either this is the new closest one or it isn't. So the way we update this parent is we say um, best if best for So the distance from this vertex to itself is zero. So if best four is greater than zero, then set it to zero. So it's like setting best four equals um, max, the maximum of the best, the previous best value, and 
the distance from 4 to 4. Now, what we, a different issue is getting the distance between two vertices. For example, we have um, like this, we have the distance between these two. We'll want, we'll want to be able to get the distance between any two vertices. So for example, these have distance 5 because it takes 5 like edges to get there. The distance between these two is 4. Right, one, two, three, four. Yep. And so on. So, um, there's a way we can do this. And, well, it's not really relevant to centroid decomposition. Basically, we can do dist um, with LCA, which is a which is the lowest common ancestor, and it's really not that important. All you have to know for this is that there's a way to efficiently compute it. This hand right? Yep. Efficiently, um, let's say O of 1 or O of log of n. Either way, both of these work. Um, o of log n isn't that bad, and it's easier to implement, in my opinion. So we'll assume that distance is O of log n, because O of 1 is like a special type of computation you have to do. <clears throat> so again, you don't have to know how LCA works for this tutorial. All you, do, all you have to know is that we can get it in O of log n. That means the distance between any two vertices, we can get it efficiently in O of log n. Um, perfect. So, let's get that out of the way. Now again, we set, we already set this one to zero because it's red. So now we set the distance between these two is one. So if this one is less than one, then we'll, or if this, if best of this vertex is greater than one, then we'll set it to one. Same here, if this is greater than 2, we'll set it to 2, and if this is greater than 3, we'll get it to 3. So we essentially set um, the value of best for each vertex to the minimum of its previous value of best and the distance from the vertex we just changed to it, since that's just how we would do it. We have a new vertex that's red, and if it's better than the last one, we'll change it. So that's how we maintain best. And then after every update, we guarantee that this information is accurate. That is, best v stores the closest red vertex in every subtree. If there's no red vertex, um, like say 12, for example, we'll just set it to infinity. And then when we take the minimum, it'll automatically set it to um, what we want. So because uh, the constraints are 10 to the fifth, you can treat infinity as any distance that's never going to occur in the tree, so for example, I use 2 times 10 to the 5th, because that's bigger than every possible path length that will ever exist. And because there's always at least one red vertex, we'll guarantee that we'll always have an answer that isn't this. So infinity can be whatever you want, as long as it's actually it, ac it actually behaves like infinity. Anyway, so now... Let's assume this change is permanent, and this is permanently red. In fact, every every update is like permanent. That is, once you set a vertex to red, it will always be red again. You'll never set it back, which is also important. Um, yes. I think it is... I think it is possible to... It should be possible to support changing it back with basically the same method, but it's not really that necessary. So, anyway. Um, yeah, it should be. In fact, it would be the exact same technique. But anyway, we'll get into that later. So, right now, what we want to do is, well, first of all, let's ask how long does it take to make an update? At worst, like let's say you have a tree like a straight line, 
and then you update this vertex, for example, and you have like, I don't know, 10 to the fifth vertices in between, then this is going to be O of n to make an update. And also, the cost of calling a distance function is log n. So it's O of n log n at worst per update, which is not great. And like it's very inefficient, but we'll be able to make it better later. So now let's figure out how we do a query. So for example, we're going to query this one. Or let's say we query this one. All right, so the way this works is there are two cases for where the optimal red node is. Either it's in this subtree. This doesn't have a subtree, but let's say we'll check it anyway. Then it's then it's just basically best of this. So if it's in three subtree, it would be best three. And otherwise, um, otherwise, it's not in this subtree, which means it has to go through some parent or some ancestor of this vertex. So again, these are the possible ancestors of three. And it has to go through one of these. For example, let's say this was red and none of the other two were red. Then the path would have to go like this. It would go up first to the ancestor and then back down to three. And similarly, this path goes up to the ancestor with label two and then down to three. So no matter what, if a path isn't, if a red vertex isn't in the subtree, then the path to it will go through some ancestor which means we can use the best values since we know we can use the best values here here and here since we know that it's going to be in its subtree because if it's not in this vertex of subtree then it'll be in a higher one such as for example this one so what we do is we just check for each ancestor the closest node to that and then, since the path will go up to this, we also have to add the distance where it goes back down to here. So the expression would be, for example, distance from 3 to 2 plus best 2. And, of course, this will be 1 when we check it for this one. And it'll be, again, 0 when we check it for this one. So yeah, um, that should be good. That's what we do essentially. We check the distance from our target vertex to the ancestor, and then we check the closest vertex to the ancestor. So we can simulate this exactly on this tree. So for example, here, the best, best of three is infinity, so we can't do anything. Here, um, this is one away, and best of two is one because we have this vertex that's one below it. So now our answer is two. All right, before it was infinity, so now it's two. Then we check here. Best of one is two because we have this. But because we go down here, this path up to here and then back down here is going to be strictly longer. So it doesn't matter that best v, it doesn't matter that the value of best one is actually in a smaller subtree as well because it'll be, it'll be strictly better when we look at it from this subtree anyway. So we can just ignore that. But yeah, so this, this value of best one would be two, and then the distance will be two, so we will look at four. Four is bigger than two, so we'll ignore it. And then here, the value of best zero is zero, because the closest thing to itself is itself, but at the same time, The distance is 3, 3 is bigger than 2, so we ignore it. And again, we don't have to check any of these other vertices, because we know a path, any path in this subtree will have to go up here through this ancestor. So we'll look at it anyway when we look at the best value of this ancestor. And that's why this solution works.
because it efficiently encompasses all possible vertices. But again, so the answer for this would be two. But again, the issue is the height of the tree in another, for example, a bamboo that just is very, very tall. And then we query like the bottom vertex or something every time. It's going to be, it's going to be n squared. It's going to be worse than n squared actually, because distance is once again o of log n. So it's going to be n log n per query and update. So you might be questioning me right now because we're 20 minutes into this tutorial and all I've given you is an n squared log n solution. Um, you'd be right to question me. However, there's more we can do with this. And this tutorial is about centroid decomposition. So now how do we use that to optimize this? Let's say, let's say, um, Sorry, let's say, let's define what a centroid is. I'll get rid of all these, um, what do I just do? Squiggles. Okay. So a centroid in a tree is any vertex with the following property. Let's say I remove this from the tree. Now we have two separate subtrees. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be two. For example, if we remove this one, we'll have three. Um, yeah, so it's, we remove a vertex and we look at the resulting subtrees. A centroid is a node such that when you remove it, all of the resulting subtrees have at most half of the original size of the tree. So if we had n nodes, then every single subtree is going to have at most floor over floor n over two nodes. This is a centroid. Um, so this vertex here is not a centroid because this tree has way more than n over two nodes. This vertex is also not a subtree because this, sorry, this is not a centroid because like obviously it just it keeps everything else. However, there is a centroid here, and let's just first count the number of nodes. We have thirteen, so n equals thirteen, which means all subtrees must have greater than or equal to six. So size. Must be, or sorry, size must be less than or equal to six. Um, okay, so it turns out the centroid is this one because when we remove it, we have three subtrees. This has size five, this has size three, and this has size four. All of these are less than or equal to six, so this node is perfect. Okay. So, something we can prove is that a centroid is always going to exist in a tree. Or, yes, there will always be at least one centroid. Possibly there could be multiple ones. For example, let's say I draw out this tree. Um, barely looks like a tree. But both of these nodes are centroids because when you remove this one, this will have size 2, this will have size 1. Both are less than 4 over 2 or both are less than or equal to 4 over 2, which is 2. And because it's symmetrical, we do the same thing here, and it also works. So 2 and 1. Anyway, let's prove that a centroid always, is, always exists in a tree. So first, actually we'll prove it with the algorithm we used to find it, which is very convenient, because it makes describing the implementation easier. So. Let's root the tree, which we've already done, and let's just say we start here. Okay, check if this node is a centroid. Um, it's not, because this subtree has size greater than greater than six. So let's go here, because we know that this subtree has size greater than six. Um, it has to be in this. Like it has to be in this subtree. So let's look at this node now. This node is a centroid, so we're done. But 
let's say this node wasn't a subtree. Let's say this node wasn't a centroid. Then there would be some other subtree that would have size greater than six. So we would continue going into that subtree until we find a centroid. That is the algorithm to find a centroid. We just check if it's a centroid. Otherwise, we go down into the biggest subtree and we continue the process until we do find a centroid. Now, why is it guaranteed that we're going to find a centroid? There are two parts to there are two parts to proving the centroid. The first is the kind of harder one to understand. Let's say let's say we end up here, for example. Or right now. Let's say we end up here. We'll just stay here. Okay, now right now, everything is in this node subtree. And therefore the size of the subtree that's kind of like above it is zero. So let's go down a bit into this one. Now, everything here is in this subtree, but the rest of it isn't. So we have essentially four nodes in a subtree that isn't like a descendant of this vertex. But what we can show is that in this process, the size of the subtree that's essentially above this vertex is never going to exceed six, or it's never going to exceed floor n over two. Because if it does, then what well, we moved to this vertex because this subtree has size greater than floor n over two. And if we now conjecture that this subtree also has size greater than floor n over two, well, being greater than floor n over two is the same as being greater than or equal to floor n over two plus one because these are integers. And the sum of these two subtree sizes is therefore greater than two times n over two plus one. But now here we get to a contradiction because this is greater than n. Like we have two times floor n over two um, plus two. All right, so if n is odd, then n odd then this becomes um, it becomes 2n plus 1. All oh, right now, it becomes um, sorry, n plus 1. Because this eva this expression evaluates to n minus 1 and this ev this expression evaluates to one, so or to two, so n minus one plus two is n plus one, which is bigger than n. And if n is even, then this this evaluates to n, this evaluates to two, and so we have n plus two. So in both cases, if this subtree is essentially invalid, if it's too big, and this subtree is too big, which we already know that this is too big because we moved into it then we have more than n nodes in the tree, which is obviously a contradiction. So that can't ever happen. So no matter what, let me get rid of this. Okay, ran out of erasures. So no matter what, oh, that's kind of annoying because I can't delete this purple thing now. <laughs> okay, no matter what, the size of the subtree above this vertex is going to be less than or equal to floor n over 2, which is great. That's a nice property to have. Um, let's try and erase this without getting too messy. Just kill the 8. Okay, okay, this is fine. We can fix the numbers. <laughs> Stupid, but fine. Um, all 
Okay. So therefore, a century always exists. And essentially, by doing the algorithm we just did, we're going to find it. Now, why is why is the centroid useful? What we're going to do is we're going to make kind of a new tree out of um, we're going to make a new tree out of this tree, and it's going to have the useful thing about this tree is that its depth is going to be at most O of log n. So we're going to make a new tree out of this tree, such that it like it represents this tree still, and its depth is O of log n. How do we do this? Let's find a centroid. OK, and we're going to color it. We're going to um, flood fill it in to be red. So this is a red centroid. Um, we're going to like use colors to represent the levels. So now we're going to make this centroid the root of our new tree. So now we have a bunch of new subtrees. This, this, and this, all created by removing the red node. So now we're going to solve individually for each of these subtrees. Let's find any centroid in all of them. And now we're going to make these um, uh, blue. And then blue is a level 2 centroid. So now we're going to use fill. And this is the centroid for this one. This is the centroid for this one. And this is a centroid. Also this one, but we only need one of them. So now we're going to draw these blue nodes on the tree. And then their ancestor is all going to be the red node, the level 1 centroid. So we're going to attach them to the next biggest centroid. So now we have all of these separate subtrees that we have to solve for. Like we have this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, that one, and that one. Essentially the subtrees of all nodes that haven't been colored yet. So let's use um, green for level 3. So now we're going to do this. Let's find um, any centroid essentially here, 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 and here. OK, now all of these green nodes, we're going to attach them with their parent being the blue node that's like in their, in their child subtree. So for example, we wouldn't attach this green node to this blue node because it's like in a different subtree created by the red one. And so now, if you'll notice, we have even more subtrees to solve for, and we'll do it the same way. So we can do this kind of as a recursive process. So let's finish creating this tree. So this blue node on the left has three children. Um, let me make it a bit bigger. This blue node has two children. And this blue node also has two children. So now we're going to do that, do that, do that, um, do that, do that, do that, and do that. Now we have to finish it up. Let's use purple for the last color. And we're going to use the paint bucket. So this is the only centroid remaining. And its parent, notice, is the green one, not the blue one, because the green, like we were solving for this subtree initially. And the same thing with this. Its parent is this green one. So we're going to make our two purples. And this one is going to be here, let's say. Uh, make it a bit farther out. And this one is going to be here. So now we have this new tree. Let's redo the labeling. So this is the center, the root is vertex 1. Then we have vertex 4. Uh, this is going to be painful. We have vertex 4, vertex 8, and vertex 10. Here, here, and here. 
now we have a bunch of green nodes to fill in. Let's say um, this is 5, this is 6, these two, then this is 3. Again, these are the same labels from the original tree. We just rearrange them in kind of a centroid ordering. Um, so this would be 7, this would be 9, this would be 0. Notice that the original root is not even a root anymore. And this would be 11. Then this would be node 2, it would be attached to node 3, and this would be 12. Okay. So right now, we can prove that the height of this tree is at most O of log n. Um, here's why. Because it's quite a simple proof. Each time we take a centroid, by definition, all of the remaining subtrees have size at most half. So now we solve all of these recursive... Um, We recursively solve for all of the subtrees, and then each of those subtrees, the remaining subtree sizes are also halved. And each time we go down a level of the tree, essentially, we have the remaining size of the subtrees. So it's like dividing n by 2 over and over again until we get 1. Because each time, each level, we have the size of every subtree again. And we start with a total tree of size n. So this is, this is essentially the definition of log base 2 of n, which means that we're going to have O of log n levels, essentially. And in most cases, it's not even going to approach this number. It's going to be much nicer. The worst case for a centroid tree is a straight line, because like we're going to split here, then each of these are going to be almost exactly halved, then we're going to split here, and each of those are going to be almost exactly halved, and so on. But in any case, now we have proven the height of the tree, but there's more we have to do. There's another property that is necessary for it being applicable to the original problem. And it's that every, let's pick some node, we will guarantee that the subtree of this node is, like, it's connected in the original tree. So what I mean is, for example, the subtree of 4 is connected here. There's no, like, there's no gap. It's not, uh, we'll use a different color, because the edges are maroon. Um, I don't know. Cyan? Turquoise? Okay. So, for example, it's, it's all connected. It's not disjoint, like, half of it is here, and the other half of it is here, for example. It's always going to be connected. And the reason this is true is because of the way we construct the tree. Let's, for example, look at this node. Right. So before we marked this node as a centroid and split it into subtrees and solve for all of these recursively, this was part of a big subtree. And everything in this subtree, where this is the centroid of it, is going to be its child in the tree. That's how we construct it. Then, because of this, all of its children are going to be in the subtree together next to it. And we know that there's no like other external nodes because, like for example, if if node eleven was in its subtree, then we would have had to have had we would have had to have constructed the like this would have to be a centroid of a subtree that includes eleven. But because eleven is not a child, all right. That that's like the criteria for eleven being a child of four. That this would have had to been have been a subtree that includes eleven, but because it isn't, we know that eleven and any other node is not a child of four, and therefore any subtree is going to be connected. We can show with a few more examples. For example, the subtree. Of, I said it again, the um, subtree of eight is connected here. Um, Obviously, the whole tree is connected. The subtree of 11 is connected. Also, the subtree of 10. All right, that includes this one. And so on. Because of the way we constructed the tree, this is always going to be true. Okay, let's get back to the original problem now. Now that we have this tree, like, what do we do with this? Because... 
we still haven't gotten anywhere with the problem. We still have an n squared log n solution. But now that we have the centroid tree, there's a cool property. We can exploit the properties that we just showed. First of all, the height is O of log n. That's important. It'll come back to us later. But the fact that every subtree of the centroid tree is contiguous is also important. Because what it means is, like for example, we have the subtree of 4. It means that every, every other vertex that's adjacent to the subtree, for example, the only vertex that's adjacent to the subtree is the red one. And every other vertex that's adjacent is going to be a parent of this vertex in the centroid tree. Now, this is an even bigger claim than before. Um, and the reason this is true is also because of the way we constructed the tree. Let's say this was not a parent, right? Then it would have to be a child because we found this vertex to be the centroid. We found this vertex to be a centroid, and if this was not a parent, then because, like, because the higher depth centroids essentially cut apart the tree, if this was not a parent, then this would not have been cut apart, and therefore it would be a big subtree. And if this is still a centroid, which it is, then all of these, all of the vertices, including this one, would have to be a child. So all neighboring vertices of this subtree are either children, and in fact they're part of the subtree, or their parents. And that's the claim. We'll show it with a few more examples, I guess. So if we take the subtree of 7, it's surrounded by the higher red node and the higher blue node. Take the subtree of 12, it's surrounded by a green node, which is a parent. And so on. If we take this blue subtree, it'll be surrounded by only the 1, which is, of course, a parent of 8. So again, because of the way we constructed it, either neighboring vertices are going to be children or parents. And all children are going to be in the subtree. So any vertex that's not in the subtree, but adjacent to it, is a parent of the vertex we're focusing on in the centroid tree. Not necessarily in the tree root at zero, but in the centroid tree. Okay, and from this claim, we can say that every other vertex, like for example, say we're trying to answer the, back to the original problem, we're trying to get the closest red node, the closest node circled red, not the red centroid to this vertex. So we'll claim either it's in this subtree or it's blocked off by some other ancestor. And because every adjacent node to this subtree is an ancestor in the centroid tree, this is true. So for example, all of these vertices are blocked off from this by the red one. And the red is an ancestor of this blue one. So that's still true. For the 7, the 9 is blocked off by the 8, which is an ancestor of 7. And everything else is blocked off by the 1, which is also an ancestor. So without the examples again, this is a direct... <coughs> this is basically a direct corollary of the fact that every neighboring vertex is adjacent. Okay. Now... We're going to change the definition of best v a bit, and instead of um, the original subtree, we're going to say it's the closest vertex in centroid subtree. So to solve for 4, best, best of 4 is going to encompass all of these vertices rather than all of these vertices. So it's not... It's not these, it's instead these. Why does this help? Because, well, first of all, we can do this. Because again, we've shown that we have the exact same property. Either, 
we have the exact same cases for our queries. Either the closest red node is included in best of four, or it's or it goes through some parent in the centroid subtree, and therefore it'll be included in the best of this one. So we can do the exact same expression that we need for all all centroid parents that is parents of four in the centroid tree it will be the maximum or it will be the minimum value of dist distance from four to whatever the parent is so for example four and one plus the closest ver the closest red vertex to 1 which in this case would be this zero plus best 1 so this is why we need the distance function because these two vertices aren't necessarily connected they can be on opposite sides of the tree for example um so we use the distance function because it can compute the distance between any two vertices, no matter where they are in O of log n. And, yeah, so because we've changed the definition of best and the definition of dist, um, actually, even though we've changed them, it's still the same. It's easy to compute. So that's how we handle queries. We Instead of looking at all the parents in the original tree, we look at this itself, and then we look at all the parents in the centroid tree. And now to do updates, we kind of do the same thing. We update this, and then because this, uh, because let's say we set five to red, changing five to red is going to change all of the vertices where best v includes this vertex. So that would be all parents of this vertex in the centroid tree. So we update. We update best of four of four with the distance from four to five, or the distance from five to four, which is one. However, best four is already zero, so we ignore it. Um, but then we also update one, and this distance is four. No, wait, this distance is three, but best of one is already one, so we ignore it. But for example, let's say we were updating node 12, then we would look at a, let's say we're updating node 12, then we would look at 11, and best of 11 is, well, there's no red vertex in its subtree yet, so it's infinity. So we'll set this to 2. Then we go up another parent to 10. Um, best of 10 is also infinity because there's no red vertex in its sub, oh wait, sorry. Um, 10 includes 0, so best of 10 is 1. And therefore, we ignore it because this distance is 2. And then, um, I should make this red. And then we also go up to 1, and we check, and the distance of here is 3. Wait, 1, 2, no, sorry, 4. But because best of 1 is 0 from this vertex, we can ignore it. So it's, the thing is, it's the exact same thing we did with the original tree, except now we just have a new tree. But again, we've shown that even though this is a different tree, because these subtrees are contiguous, and therefore all of the, every vertex either goes through an ancestor of this in the centroid tree, or is in the subtree itself, we can do the exact same thing. And in fact, we can do it for any tree where... We can take any tree, for example, we'll root it here, and then just use this as the whole tree. We can do the exact same thing. As long as we have the property that any, any path either go, let's say we root the tree here, then we use this. Any path either goes through this vertex or goes through a parent of this, through an ancestor of this vertex down to here. There are certain trees that won't work. For example, 
if we draw an edge between 12 and then 9, and then let's say, for example, 2, and then everything else is in... This would be weird, actually. Let's say we put, um, let's say we root the vertex, at, root the tree at 12, actually. Then we put 10 and 12 in different subtrees. Maybe that won't work, for example. Because we're not necessarily taking the optimal path. But because every, just to hammer this in, because every vertex, or because every path is either in the subtree of this, and therefore it's in some contiguous subtree, then this is the shortest path from any vertex in the subtree to the blue node. Otherwise, the shortest path from any other vertex to the blue node has to pass through the red. And there's no like overlap. Like we don't do some stupid inefficient path like go down to 12, then go back to 4 because that would be wrong. Instead, we go through 0 or we go through 1 down to 4. And again, that's why this works. So this is cool because, well, we've kind of skipped over the other part. The height is O of log n. Height. Right? So, like, each vertex is going to have O of log n ancestors in the centroid tree. So, both query and update... update are O of, because distance is also O of log n, query and update are O of log squared n. And that's it. Um, we're basically done here. This is enough to solve the problem. So, Yeah, so the complexity of answering queries is thus O of, let's say we have Q queries, it's Q times log squared of N. And because everything is 10 to the fifth, and you have a time limit of 5 seconds, this is going to pass fine. But again, you can also use optimized LCA to get rid of this squared, and then just make it Q log N. But it's not that big a deal. Um, unless you're using other languages, I guess. But anyway... Now let's talk about how to implement this. It's going to be a very long tutorial, but let's talk about how to implement this. Um, okay. So, what do we do here? We can get rid of this. And then, get rid of this. Okay. There are Multiple things we need to do. First, we need to find centroids. Let's say we're solving for this. Let's say we're solving for this whole tree, right? So first, we start here. Again, we've kind of already gone over this algorithm, but I'll just rehash it. There's going to be code in the blog. You can check that out if you don't exactly understand the explanations. But here, we're going to start here. This is not a centroid, so we're going to go into the biggest subtree, and then. We've already proven why this works, so I won't do it again. So now, this is a centroid, so we finish. And that's essentially what we do. But now let's say we're sol solving for this subtree, and we start here. Now, we would have to kind of root the tree here. So the size of this remaining subtree is 4, which is bigger than... Uh, 5 over 2 floor is 2, so that's too big. So now we're going to go here, and the size of the remaining subtree is 3, which is also too big. So now we're going to go here, and this is big enough. So that's it. We just keep moving into the, into the biggest subtree until we find a centroid. That's how we do it. So once we do find a centroid, this is O of n in the worst case, and... Now we have to solve for these remaining subtrees, so let's do the same thing. It, the implementation would kind of be like a DFS, where we mark this node as visited, so we never look at it again. 
Then we just solve as if this were the root, as if this were the root, and as if this were the root in these three subtrees. And we'll treat them independently. So then we'll find the centroid, and then we'll say that the parent of this is the next biggest centroid, which is that. And the way we do this is in our DFS, we can kind of keep track of the parent as we go down. So the parent of whatever centroid we find in this subtree is going to be this. Then we find this is a centroid, then we solve here. And the parent of whatever we find in this subtree is going to be this, is going to be vertex 4, and so on. Um, yeah, the traversal is very simple. The only thing left is computing subtree sizes, and that is a uh, simple like dynamic programming thing. Um, the size of a vertex V is 1, because we include V, plus the sum of every vertex, let's call it um, A, where A is an element of the children of V, which essentially means it's the sum over all children of V of size A. So, of course, we have to compute size A first, so we do it recursively with the DFS. And then once we compute all children of V, then we compute the value for V, and then we go back up and compute the ancestors, and it's just how DFS works. I ignore that last part. So that's what we would do in terms of implementation. We find the centroid in every subtree we're solving for. To do that, we have to um, find subtree sizes. Okay, there's one last thing we can go over in terms of implementation, which is computing the distance function. Um, wait, let's undo as much as we can first. Oh, shoot. Okay, so we're going to compute the distance function. And let's just get a new tree because this one is already disgusting. So we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here. And we want the distance between these two nodes, for example. So if you've ever seen my heavy light decomposition tutorial, um, which is the past one I uploaded, you'll know that any path from between two vertices can be broken up into two components. It's the path from one vertex up to the LCA, and the LCA is the lowest common ancestor, and the path from the LCA down to the other vertex. Now you may think we just made our problem harder because now we have two paths to solve for. <clears throat> but the cool thing here is that both of these paths are like they're vertical, which means they go from some vertex to an ancestor of it. So the, dis the length of this path is going to be the difference in depths between this vertex and this vertex and the same thing here. So for example, the depth of this is zero, the depth of these two is one, and the depth of these two is two. So the total sum of this path would be the difference between 2 and 0, which is 2, plus the difference between 0 and 1, which is 1. So the total path sum is 3. Now let's undo all of that. And so the formula we get is, let's say this were A, B, and this is L for LCA. Then it's the depth of A. It's the depth of A minus the depth of LCA because depths get lower as you go bigger. Or as you get, depths get higher as you go lower. Sorry. That is not a P. Well, I don't know what I just drew there, but that is not a letter. Minus depth of L. And then add that to the same thing for B. Depth B minus depth. of L. And that's enough. You can simplify it into, um, like, you can do depth of A plus depth of B minus 2 times this, because, like, these are the same. But it doesn't really matter. That's the formula. All you have to do is you have to be able to get the LCA quickly. And there are multiple algorithms you can use to do that. It doesn't really matter which one you use. You can do it in either O of 1 or O of law. You can do an O of 1 by, like, doing offline LCA, which is annoying. Or you can just use something like binary lifting. Um, that is essentially it. So now that we've done distance, um, is that all I have left to cover?
Well, there's. I also include code for um, doing the queries and updates, but I don't need to talk about that here because we've already gone over how that works. And yeah, so there are a few more notes on central decomposition. Um, like there are more ways to use it than just this. This the way we did it here is kind of a bottom up approach. That is, we start at some vertex here, then. Either something happens with this vertex, for example, either the closest red node is in this subtree, or it goes through some parent in the centroid tree. So it's kind of bottom up where we start here and we work our way up using the information we have at each parent. And yeah, it's kind of a bottom up style. Um, however, other problems can like, they can be different. For example, you could do them in like a, Kind of a top-down manner too. Let's say we have to do some like s some problem with pads, right? So we'll solve it for all pads that go through this vertex. Let's say we can do it in L of n or something. Um, L of n, and then we solve for all paths going through this vertex. Now we'll solve for all paths that don't go through that vertex in other subtrees. And let's say, again, each level takes O of n to compute. And because we use the centroid, again, we have the size of each subtree each time. So we have O of log n levels at most. Levels. So in total, the complexity is O of n log n. And that is essentially it. So um, there's a theorem that proves that the math does in fact work this way. It's called the master theorem. I link it in the blog. Um, it's slightly more complicated than just multiplying O of n by O of log n, but it basically works the same way. So yeah. Um, That proves the complexity. And at the same time, it also shows that the complexity of constructing the centroid tree itself is O of n log n. Because each level takes O of n to compute, we have log n levels, and therefore it's O of n log n in total. So that would be it. We've totally exhausted the space on this paint page. And uh, that's all I have to say. Please leave feedback. This was. This felt very hard to explain. I feel like it was definitely awkward at some points. So if you don't understand anything and have also tried reading the blog version and just don't get what I'm saying, you can just leave a comment either on the video or on the blog, preferably on the blog, because then I can use like math mode, like fancy sums and stuff. That's always nice. Um, but yeah, that should be it. Let's leave it at that. Hope you enjoyed, and I hope you got something out of this. Even if it wasn't the full concept, maybe you can understand, say, some piece of it or something. And that's helpful because if you piece together a bunch of individual pieces, eventually you'll get the full picture. Um, so yeah, it's not always necessary to understand everything from one go. You can just learn it however it works for you. Anyway, that was Centroid Decomposition. Uh, goodbye, everyone.